In today's video, we're going to look at magnetic fields at A-level, and in particular how they explain the motor effect and move on to particle accelerators. Um, so what are the basics of magnetic fields? Um, now you will be familiar with this diagram here, the magnetic field lines around a bar magnet or a permanent magnet travel from north to south. We can see this by using iron filings or by plotting compasses and placing them around the edge to see their direction. Um, so this is for permanent magnets, and um, we are much more concerned at A-level with magnets that are caused by currents flowing through a wire. Um, so if I've got some current flowing through this wire here, I can find the magnetic field shape around it by using something called the right hand grip rule. As you can see from the diagram, the magnetic fields uh, form a circular pattern. Um, and if the wire is traveling in the direction that your thumb is traveling on your right hand, uh, then your fingers curl in the direction of the magnetic field. So if I can go clockwise or anti-clockwise, if you're looking in the direction of your thumb, uh, they go clockwise. Um, you kind of have to see this yourself um, with your own right hand. So current is your thumb, fingers are the magnetic field. Now using both these types of magnetic field, we can explain the motor effect. So let's say I've got a permanent magnet, um, I've got a north and a south pole, and between it I've got a wire with a current flowing through it. Now it's important to note here that the current is conventional current, um, so we're assuming it travels from positive to negative even though we know electrons don't do that. Um, so we've got this magnetic field around the wire in this circular pattern we've just seen, and we've also got the magnetic field going from north to south. Now the magnetic fields, um, basically the two magnetic fields interact uh, with each other. Now they essentially overlap, um, using the phrase interact is one that comes up on A-level mark schemes, um, but the reason uh, we're interested in why that happens is because it causes the wire to move, because it causes there to be some force on the wire. So if I was looking at a definition for the motor effect, I would say something like a current carrying wire placed perpendicular to an external or another magnetic field will experience a force. Now that force depends on a couple of different factors, uh, which you may remember from GCSE. That depends on uh, the current, the uh, magnitude or size of the current flowing through the wire, uh, the length of the wire, um, and also the size of the magnetic field, the magnetic field strength. Uh, now we commonly call this magnetic flux density which will be an important definition when you look at uh, electromagnetic induction and things like that. So because force depends on those three factors, if we multiply them together, uh, we've got the current I, um, the length of the wire L, and we've got the magnetic flux density, the symbol B. Um, all the units should be straightforward other than the Tesla. Um, so Tesla is the unit for magnetic flux density, and that is equal to, if you were to rearrange this equation, it's force divided by current times length, uh, which means one Tesla is equal to one Newton per meter per amp. One thing to note at this point is the orientation of the wire relative to the magnetic field. Um, so we said in our definition there's perpendicular. Um, so you have a force, it doesn't have to be perpendicular. Um, so if you do view it from above, we've got the wire kind of perpendicular to the field lines, um, so the right angle between them. That's when the maximum force will be experienced. So the maximum force is when uh, the angle uh, between the field lines and the wire um, is 90 degrees. Uh, there'll be zero force if they're parallel or the angle is zero. Anywhere between zero and 90, there'll be some force, uh, which depending on the orientation of the uh, the field lines or the wire and the angles you're given, uh, you will have to resolve um, using trigonometry sort of cos or sine um, to find the component that is perpendicular uh, to the field lines. Okay, so to find the direction of the wire, the direction of the force in the wire, we can use the fantastic Fleming's left hand rule, um, which um, I've put a picture in here because I'm not going to try and uh, draw the left hand rule properly. Um, so what it says is I've got uh, my thumb, my index finger, my first finger, and my middle finger. Um, it says that if I've got my first finger lined up with a field from north to south, my second finger lined up with a current um, from uh, positive to negative, so a conventional current, my thumb will point in the direction of the force. So in this case, for my diagram, field's going left to right current's going current's going towards me um, so therefore my uh, force of my wire um, is going to go up if I was to reverse the current um, if keep everything else the same uh, that means my thumb is now pointing upwards so therefore it's going to move upwards now having the motor effect, um, having a wire move up or down um, is kind of cool, uh, but not particularly useful. So using an electric motor um, requires things to be spinning or moving. So for example, an electric drill in a food mixer uh, or the wheels on an electric car. Uh, the idea is we want current uh, to change into some form of circular motion. Uh, we see you can drive something and use it um, for all those different uses. Uh, so to make a motor um, out of the motor effect, uh, we need a coil of wire uh, for reasons which I'll explain in a moment. So we've got a coil of wire, um, so not just just a piece of wire. Now we have to connect that to a circuit because um, we want the current to be flowing through it. Um, so I've got a little cell down here with current going from positive to negative, meaning for my coil of wire, uh, the current is flowing up the right hand side and down the left hand side as shown. 
Now, because we've got a current flowing in opposite directions on each side of the coil, uh, that means each side of the coil will experience a force in the opposite direction due to Fleming's left-hand rule. So in this case, uh, do you remember before I had the current flowing uh, towards me? That means my thumb is up, that means it's going upwards, and the current away from me means the wire is moving down. Um, so this will cause it to spin, or there'll be a resultant moment uh, exerted on the wire on each side of the coil. Now, uh, the special name for this, if I've got a moment acting in one direction, another, action, another moment acting in the opposite direction, but in the same rotational direction, uh, we call that a couple. So, um, th that will happen to cause the wire to rotate. However, we need something called a split ring commutator uh, to make it carry on spinning. Uh, so what this does is it reverses the current every half turn um, or every half rotation. Um, so that means that the right hand side keeps going down. Otherwise, it's going to go up, then down, up, then down. It's going to oscillate. We don't want that to happen. We want the right hand side keep going down uh, so the current needs to flip um, every half turn so that keeps happening and it does cut out where the gaps are um, but the coil is already moving so the momentum keeps it going um, and so it doesn't stop so that's the motor effect dealt with. Now the motor effect can be further explained in more detail by looking at the charges inside the wire. Um, now it goes uh, without saying if the um, electrons experience a force, um, then because there's so many of them all going in the same direction inside the magnetic field, that's actually what's causing the wire to move. Uh, so because the electrons are charged, um, they experience a force in a magnetic field um, the same as the wire does in general. Um, but it's also true of individual charges. And that only occurs um, when uh, the velocity of electrons is not zero. So when they're moving so that explains why there has to be a current flowing for this to happen now we can derive a quite neat equation for the force on each individual charge and um, we start off with bil instead of current and um, we say current is the rate of flow of charge uh, so delta q over t or just q over t in this instance so therefore force is now going to be equal to b times by charge over time times by length and uh, we can also express the length slightly differently now if we consider the length of one uh, piece of wire that's in our magnetic field uh, we consider the electrons moving along now their velocity uh, we could say is equal to the length of the wire or the distance divided by the time rearranging this for length um, or distance we have distance equals velocity times time um, so we could replace that instead of the L um, and we might notice uh, things become a little bit simpler so what we can notice is that we've got two uh, terms of T uh, one on top and one on bottom of a fraction uh, uh, which cancel quite nicely gives us f equals b q v uh, where b is the magnetic flux density uh, q is charge and v is velocity in meters per second um, so like we talked about before the factors that affect the velocity uh, for one charge is the flux density that affects it is the charge that affects it is the velocity that affects it um, this only occurs when velocity of the charges is um, has a component perpendicular to the magnetic field uh, f is zero force is zero when the two are parallel um, f is also zero when the, the it's not moving or there's no charge so it won't work with neutrons um, and it won't work with any particles that aren't moving to begin with so um, in how we represent this with diagrams is to look at um, a magnetic field and um, in this case the crosses represent the magnetic field being pointing into the page and uh, again this is quite hard to visualize sometimes because it's 3d but this is the easiest way of doing it so let's say I've got a proton with a velocity moving into the magnetic field uh, with an initial velocity V so what's gonna happen when it goes into the magnetic field it experiences a force perpendicular to its velocity so therefore the velocity of the proton uh, moves kind of in the upwards direction now again it experience of force experience of force at each point um, so this velocity is changing um, in a kind of circular mo manner um, so because there's a force that's perpendicular to it at each point now building up those over time we'll see the path of the proton um, essentially is starting to form a curve or a part of a circle now note here the velocity doesn't change and um, the force is perpendicular uh, to the velocity and also perpendicular to the magnetic field that's why you have to be really careful to think in 3d for these examples so the particle is now moving in circular motion which we'll come back to uh, why that's important a little later. We can also use Fleming's left hand rule to determine the direction on our particle um, and we can use Fleming's left hand rule as it is um, for protons because current um, we said with, with the second finger is conventional meaning it is assuming that particles have a positive charge or moving positive to negative. Now we know they're not but that's the way the rule works. So we can use it as it is for protons. We've got the first finger is the field, the current is represented by the second finger, and the thumb represents the force, which direction it's going to move in. However, with electrons, because they have a negative charge, we have to flip the current finger um, or the uh, second finger into going the other direction. So it kind of goes uh, sort of logically that if I reverse the charge on our particle here, in this example, um, the electron is now going to move downwards. It's going to experience a force um, in that direction, so it's going to curve in the opposite direction to the proton. 
And this is also kind of helpful when we look at uh, the early days of particle physics, looking at how um, the cloud chambers identify particles. You have a magnetic field. How do you know whether something's an electron or a positron? Uh, well, you look at the part the track and see which way it turns, um, and that would identify the particle for your help you identify it. Now, as I mentioned earlier, uh, these charged particles are showing circular motion. So just like with gravitational fields and electric fields, anything exhibiting circular motion, uh, we can apply the ideas of centripetal force uh, to them. Uh, so what we're going to do um, is equate together the force experienced by a charge due to the magnetic field with the centripetal force. Um, so we've got BQV on the left hand side of our equation here, we've got MV squared over R on the right. Uh, now that's going to help us derive an expression for the radius of the orbit, um, basically how tightly curled the orbit is of the charged particle. Uh, so we cancel the V, uh, the squared of the right hand side and the V of the left hand side um, and we can rearrange this whole thing for R which gives us R equals MV over BQ. Now this quite neat derivation um, is not in the AQA spec as an equation, um, it comes up quite a lot in terms of how to derive it um, and it also tells us a couple of things about the orbit of these uh, different charged particles. Um, so this is proportional to the mass and the velocity of the particles assuming um, and so it tells us a couple of important things about the orbit of these particles, um, which is that the um, radius of orbit is proportional to the mass and the velocity and inversely proportional to the field strength and the charge. Now, one of the sneaky thing questions can ask you to do um, is to um, work this out, make this derivation in terms of specific charge. So specific charge um, is the charge per unit mass of a particle. So essentially, I've got Q and I've got M in this equation. I just need to rearrange that whole equation so that M, Q over M is the subject. And if I do that, I end up with V over BR. Magnetic fields are essential to understanding all modern particle accelerators. So some of the earliest particle accelerators were linear um, and then use electric fields to help accelerate particles. Um, but we've got a couple of recent um, inventions talking in the last kind of four or five decades um, that are called cyclotrons and synchrotrons, uh, which work in a circle. They all use magnetic fields to help bend particles path uh, to keep them going in a circle. And now particle accelerators, the whole idea is to get particles to be really fast. Um, so they can either be used in uh, applications like medical purposes or to smash into each other like in the Large Hadron Collider um, and find out things about um, particle physics. Um, so we're going to look at cyclotrons today. Um, they're the most interesting in terms of magnetic fields um, and these are the ones you'd find used in hospitals um, and used to make uh, radioactive isotopes and for proton beam therapy and things like that. So um, these two parts of the cyclotron are called Ds, um, kind of as the name suggests, they're shaped like Ds, and they've got a magnetic field applied. Uh, in this case, uh, we're going into um, the page or into the screen from your point of view. The particles start off in the center, and we'll start off with a positive particle, um, and we apply an electric field um, between those Ds, between those two areas of magnetic fields. So um, the particle initially um, is going to be accelerated um, kind of across the gap, and that's going to happen a few different times, uh, which will come across one stage at a time. Particle is attracted to or feels a, a kind of attractive force to the negative plate and therefore accelerates across the gap getting faster. When it's in the first D, um, just as we looked at in earlier in the video, we've got a a uh, force exerted on it which is going to make it travel in a kind of curve um, in a circular motion until it kind of reaches the edge of the D again. So when it reaches the end it's curved round um, and it's going to experience that electric field again. Now the electric field switches at this point so that it's now got a positive, um, uh, the positive part of the field is where the particle is located and it's going to get accelerated across the gap because the negative field has now changed to the other D. Next, it's going to do the same thing. It's going to curve around and then cross the gap again, where the charge flips again to being negative um, on the opposite side, and then go to the other side, and the same thing happens again and again and again. It's accelerating between the gap, and it's getting its direction curved uh, inside the Ds, so that um, by the time it reaches uh, kind of the edge of the spiral and hits the target, whatever the designated target is, it's going to be traveling a lot faster than it was initially. So um, we've got here our equation from earlier, the radius of orbit of the particle is equal to uh, um, V over BQ and it states the faster the particle is going the larger the radius of orbit um, which is why the spiral continues getting bigger and bigger each time. Now in this case the mass of the particle isn't changing, the field isn't changing uh, and charge isn't changing so those are all constants. We can work out the time taken for one rotation or one sort of orbit of the particle around the circle using our equation from earlier. We're going to substitute in instead of v, um, the speed equals distance over time, which is 2 pi r over one time period. So instead of v on the top here, we've now got 2 pi r over t. 
So simplifying this expression further, I've got the expression r equals 2 pi r m over t b q. Uh, rearranging for t, because that's what we're trying to find out, the time for one rotation. Um, we've got an r on the top and the bottom of this expression, so that can cancel. Uh, giving us overall the time for one rotation is equal to 2 pi m over b q. Uh, and just as well as time period, we can work out the frequency, which is 1 over t, uh, which is the, uh, the flipped over fraction, which is b q over 2 pi m. Now, the thing, important things to notice about this is that the time taken for one rotation is independent of the velocity of the particle and also r. So it doesn't mean how big the spiral is getting. Um, the particle is going to take the same amount of time to do one rotation as the smallest uh, kind of radius in the middle. And this is really useful. It's really fundamental to understanding how these particle accelerators work. Um, because the time period or frequency is constant, it means that this electric field can be alternating at the same frequency. So it can flip the exact same amount of times when the particle crosses the gap. It doesn't matter on the particle speed or radius. Uh, it can change direction with a constant time period or frequency, for example, 100 hertz. Um, it doesn't need to change. Let's look finally at mass spectrometers. Um, so these are used in chemistry a lot. Um, they're used to identify different elements or isotopes in a sample. Uh, we're not going to look too much at what they use for because you have to take chemistry A level for that. Uh, we're going to look at the physics of how they work. Um, so to start off with, um, we've got a sample. Um, usually it's a, in a gas form um, and it's ionized. So initially, um, meaning it's going to have all of the particles are going to have you know electron ripped off them, um, meaning they can be positive. So therefore, they can be deflected by uh, electric and magnetic magnetic fields. Uh, so we've got our positive ions in a stream here, or a beam of positive ions, and now we're going to travel through two parts of our mass spectrometer. So the first one is called a velocity selector. Now as the name suggests, that's going to select um, particles of a certain velocity to continue through to the next stage. It does this by applying an electric field and a magnetic field at the same time to the particles, um, which I'll explain how that works in a second. So in this case here, I've got the electric field, I've got a positive um, part on the top of the particles, a negative part on the bottom, um, and we've got magnetic field is pointing into the page um, in this example. So the particles are going to experience, those positive ions are going to experience a force um, from each field. Now, if they were to be affected too much by the electric field, they will, because they're positive, go towards a negative plate. Um, and using Fleming's left-hand rule, if they're affected too much by the magnetic field, they get deflected upwards. So they have these two forces up and down, meaning, that just those particles that are traveling at just the right velocity um, or the certain velocity can get through um, and not be affected uh, too much by either of those fields. Now, to be exact about it, uh, we can equate the expression for magnetic field, uh, the force for a magnetic field, BQV, with the force from an electric field, which is EQ, E capital E being electric field strength. So equating those two things together, um, we've got a charge in both sides of the equation, uh, which means it kind of cancels down nicely. Uh, to give us the velocity we're talking about here um, is equal to the electric field strength divided by the magnetic field strength or magnetic flux density. This has only happened because you've got the force going upwards of uh, the magnetic field and downwards of the electric field. Only particles traveling at just the right speed get through that gap. So why are we bothering to do all this? Why are we bothering to select particles of a certain velocity? Uh, well, when we look at the second part of the mass spectrometer, um, this time I've got magnetic field which is pointing out of the page, um, indicated by circle dots here. Um, and we're going to come back to the idea of the radius of the particle's orbit being given by mv over bq. Now, in this equation, um, we've got uh, the particles having the same magnetic flux density or field strength, because um, they're all in the same magnetic field. They all have the same charge, they're all the same similarly ionized at the beginning, um, but because they've all got slightly different masses, um, they're going to move to slightly different places and have slightly different radius or radii of orbit. But this only works if the velocity is the same. So the fact they've only got the same velocity it only occurs because we've had that velocity selector process beforehand uh, to make V constant so that the mass is proportional to r or the uh, radius of their path so the idea is that the title the lower the r is for smaller mass particles and the higher the r is for higher mass particles so if we have a detector located just at this point here um, we'll be able to detect how many of each particle goes through um, and our results would look something like this they'd be in a graph form um, you'd have certain isotopes go further certain isotopes less far um, and they can figure out what's in our sample so that's uh, magnetic fields and we're going to look another video at EM induction and generator effect. Uh, I hope you found that useful.